Thank you all for staying around for our last panel. And um, I'm Monica Bolger. I'm a senior fellow at Future of Privacy Forum. And I study the controversial issues around student privacy. And so I've done papers on personalized learning and a report on um, in Bloom. And uh, in that process, it's been really wonderful to identify amazing practice as well as um, the failures. And so today we're highlighting amazing practice. And so I'm pleased to be joined by Greg Cox, who is with the Utah Board of Education. He is a student data privacy trainer. And Carrie Gallagher, who is assistant principal for teaching and learning at St. John's Preparatory School in Danvers, Massachusetts, and also the director of K-12 education for Connect Safely in Palo Alto, California. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to start with an amazing, uh, we, were, we were preparing for this panel last week, and, and Carrie, you said something that I think really encapsulates what our goal is uh, for today with the culture, uh, creating a culture of um, privacy, and that is um, if you're developing a culture of privacy, it's not like you're checking a box. It's everyone knowing what their role is in maintaining a culture that respects data privacy, whether they're teachers working in classrooms or administrators in the district office. So thank you for that that framing. Um, what as the field of student data privacy matures, we now have these strong examples of creating a culture of privacy at the state, district, and local levels. And so um, why this quote, I think, really frames what we're talking about is that we can start thinking about how it acts at those different levels, how we can support it, and how we can, um, how we can build it in. And so uh, just as important as identifying these best practices is getting them into your hands, into the hands of the practitioners. So we're trying to go beyond a one-off, one-time materials and create this culture where, where it's something we're thinking about at every stage. Um, and so by culture, we mean that everyone has an awareness of key privacy components and how to be compliant, but also know who to ask when they encounter something new or challenging. Today we've been asking Steve, we've been asking Jim, we've been asking Bill, um, we've been asking each other, Amelia, about these questions. And we want to be sure that you know who to ask uh, when you leave here. Um, and more than that, privacy becomes a part of every conversation, whether it's tech procurement and use or about using student data. So to start off, I was wondering if you could briefly describe your programs, how you started them and what they were responding to. Carrie, would you like to start? Sure, sure, sure. So, um, so I serve, um, as um, Monica said, as the assistant principal for teaching and learning. And it doesn't sound like it's very techy, but I one of the buckets of responsibilities that I have is the academic integration of technology in an effective way. So I partner with the director of IT, but I'm the one who's really the lead on what it looks like in classrooms and how teachers are coached. And um, I'm kind of the go between between the teachers and the head of IT. Um, and so the conversations about what data privacy is and why it matters in teachers' classrooms is really on me. Um, and explaining to teachers why there has to be a request process and what we do sort of behind the IT curtain when that process is happening is something that it's, um, it's important for them to understand. So I saw a lot of you um, have access to the, the Educator's Guide to Student Data Privacy and that's a collaboration between Connect Safely and Future Privacy Forum that I was fortunate enough to co-author. and. The need for that, for me, and the reason that I was so passionate about that project, is that I found when I was in conversations about data privacy and technology use responsibly in classrooms, it was focused from the parent advocacy side or the policy side. And there were IT directors and superintendents there, but there were no classroom teachers in those conversations. And from the classroom teacher perspective, especially your innovative teachers who are really excited about a new tool that allows our students to do something that they've never done before, they feel like it's a roadblock because no one's bothered to build their capacity in what data privacy is. No one's bothered to ask them um, or to, to let them know why this is important. And so it became really important for me to create a resource that would make it easy for a district um, and even state leadership to provide that information to teachers in a way that is understandable to them. Um, they don't need all the information, but they need enough so that they understand what their responsibilities are and why these processes have to be in place. Once we did that at St. John's, um, and we used this guide a little bit, but we made it much more personalized to each department and each school and developed little mini programs for each department depending on, um, so we did it at the department level in the high school and we did it at the team level in the middle school. And we sat down with them for about 20 minutes and broke down our vetting process very simplified and had it like a red, yellow, blue, like 
Apps that do this are like a hard no. They're in the red zone. Apps that do this, we might actually say yes if you can agree to only use it in certain ways. And apps that are in the green are, you know, have these properties. And then we gave examples that of apps that had actually been requested in each of those zones too. And that's how we framed it. And we explained very briefly what FERPA was, very briefly what COPPA was. Um, and then so, sort of then let them ask questions. And they didn't really have that many questions. Their biggest thing was, thank you for doing this for us so that we don't have to worry about it. So it changed the culture from why do I have to ask a question? Why do I have to wait for this vetting process to, oh my goodness, thank goodness you're doing this for us. Just because we bothered to take the time to build their own capacity. And then they started coming to me and saying, so I have all these accounts personally with all these websites. Should I be looking at those too? And I'm like, yeah, and I would love to sit down with you and help you with that. Because I do think it's a, it's a personal literacy that we need to develop in each other as adults. So we talk a lot in these conversations about student data privacy, but are the adults that we work with really taking care of their own privacy? And shouldn't we empower them to do that as part of their learning? So that's what, that's a brief overview. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. And Greg, we've just watched one of your amazing videos. Could you also please briefly describe how you started your program and what you were responding to? Uh, yeah, so if you were here earlier, we were responding to a couple of bills that were passed um, through our legislator in 2015, 2017. Um, one of them required annual training at the school level that anyone with access to student records had to have some type of training about what, what they do with those confidential records. It didn't necessarily mention anything specific like FERPA or anything like that. Um, and then another law, which was passed in 2017, kind of created my job and our department in which we were able to kind of look at things at the state level and go, okay, what do we need? And they thought they needed a trainer, and that was me. And so we decided what's, what's the best way to, to kind of get this training. And so with board rule, uh, this, the bill didn't say what needed to be done necessarily for um, training purposes. That was the other law. But uh, we thought it was necessary that in board rule that we have a law or a, a rule where teachers were to be um, trained every time they relicense, so every three to five years. And that's kind of what that video was one of many videos about. Um, we figured, you know, it's a good refresher to have this deep kind of intense look of what FERPA is and how it's involved in the class and other laws and things that might uh, be pertained in there. And um, I was gonna mention something else. Uh, so th those are the two main bills uh, that kind of help form who we are today. Uh, but as a small department, it's kind of nice to, I'm a former teacher and I was one of those teachers that yeah. Carrie was talking about where I would go to ISTE and these types of conferences and come back and like there were literally sessions where it's like 60 apps in 60 minutes, <laughs> right? And I download every single one of them while they're going through the presentation. I bring them into my classroom because I'm that teacher, that tech teacher that like wants to be the first one to start everything and integrate it and use it. Um, and I remember talking to people of other districts and they weren't allowed to download their own software and things like that. And I was like, oh, I would never work for a school like that. You know, how awful is that work environment? <laughs> I didn't understand at the time like why they wouldn't allow that to happen. I think at the time it was even more for security than for privacy, right? I think in the last two years, privacy has kind of taken the forefront of that discussion, which is great. That's only helpful for kind of what we're talking about now. Um, but as a part of one of those, during the trainings, that's kind of how I view things, like, like you were talking about. How is this something that I'm going to be grateful for when I learn about it instead of like preventative? Why are they blocking me from doing this? So I think it's always good to approach it with that type of mindset. But as a part of uh, our Student Data Protection Act, there was a position that needed to be not necessarily created because I think very few districts actually created the, this position. They just handed it to somebody that was already within the district, which I'm sure many of you have. And this is called the data manager. And this is kind of the liaison between what's happening at the LEA, the either charter uh, district level, and us at the state. So that we can kind of give these materials to, like 
we have the relicensure course that they need to take every three to five years, but we're always coming up with different things that we can give to these schools that they can train their own faculty so that we don't have to keep, you know, kind of shoving it down their throat. We can give it to the schools and say, if you need it, here's a resource. If you don't, fine, you might need it down the road. Um, so the data managers have actually been really helpful in what we're doing just because we kind of understand from the school level what we can or be doing better for them. Thank you so much. Uh, oh. Thank you so much. Two, two points that really jumped out for me was the idea that, um, that this is an opportunity rather than something punitive and that uh, and that creative teachers really want to do this, right? They, they want to have great apps in the classroom, and so part of that is figuring out how to manage that. And it reminded me, actually, of uh, when I first started teaching, uh, this was when we were first getting, you know, when we were, not when we were first, because I was in grade school then, but uh, <laughs> otherwise I'm aging better than you I look amazing. I know. <laughs> Why, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, when I was first teaching, uh, we were getting computer labs, uh, and, and we were required to use the computer labs. Do you remember those days where it's like, we don't care what you do, you just need to use Every them. Tuesday for an hour, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly, and, and there was no instruction for how to use them or what was, or, or in terms of pedagogical practice yep. or, or, um, or any kind of consideration of safety, that's for sure. And so I wonder if we could spend just a quick minute talking about why privacy matters. Like why, why are we even here and talking about this and, and whoever wants to start. You want to take it? Sure. I mean, sure. I think it. I think. I mean, it, it has always mattered, but it's more obvious now, and we have a lot more examples in um, current media that we can pull from to explain why privacy matters. I think it was diff it was more difficult to get the buy-in from teachers six or seven years ago than it is now because yeah. there's just so much more concern out there about who has access to what information. Um, I think that the struggle is not to get buy-in from teachers now, it's the students. Mm. Um, because they've grown up in and are in the midst of this life where they don't think privacy really exists. And they're accustomed to everything being shared all the time. And so um, that's always, I think, the, the leap is not to get teachers to care, and whereas that may have been the leap years ago. Good point. I think the leap is, the, the bigger gap to jump is to get students to care. Um, because what I'm finding is once I've had these conversations with teachers and they're like, oh no, like I'm on board 100%, now I get why, we, along with requesting new books, we request new apps. Like right. that we've made okay. that part of our process. Yeah. So the request process happens in March for the next school year. So it gives my digital learning team time to go through all the books and all the apps and make sure that, number one, for compatibility with our systems to make sure they're actually gonna work because every book company on the planet is gonna tell you that their, is compat their book is compatible with every platform, but you have to test it. And then also to check the terms of use and the privacy policy and check all the wonderful resources that you know, Steve just shared and all that um, to make sure that's a good fit for your um, community's privacy concerns. So the teachers aren't the issue, it's when the student comes to a teacher, the teachers put out this awesome project for students to do that provides a lot of voice and movement, and the student says, so that's great that you recommended that I do it this way, but I use this other program at home when I'm like creating my own music that I just do for fun, and I'd really rather use that for this project, can I? Right. But on a school device not on their personal device. Then the teacher's like, what do I do? And I'm like, that, that's a really good question. Like, what do you think you should, because there's no easy answer to that. That situation needs to be navigated in a very personalized way with that right. student. So I think um, helping the student understand, okay, so you're already using this in your personal life, so that, like, I can't prevent. Could I chat with your mom, right, about does she know that much, or your dad, about does she know that much about how you're using this and how much information they have about you? and um, if you do want to use it for this project, that's fine, but maybe it needs to be on your device and you bring your device to school for that day. So I need to make, like, have set something up with our tech department and your family. And so this isn't an insurmountable hurdle, but it does take some time and attention that teachers are probably not going to feel like they have. Those of us who are charged with, like, I'm fortunate enough, I, I'm the lead on this program, and it's one school, 1,500 kids. I have two digital learning specialists. I'm well-resourced. But most people have one person for, like, 15,000 kids and can't talk through this process. Oh, so there needs to be a way to figure out um, 
how to have the conversations with kids so that they understand why it matters and how to use those conversations as an opportunity to teach them about privacy. Mm -hmm. um, because again, otherwise the kids are just gonna feel like the teachers used to feel, like it was just a hard no and they don't really know why, they're just being told no by the grownups. Thank you so much. And I love the real world examples. I think that a lot of times we talk about this sort of up here rather than like where it's actually happening. So mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. And Greg, did you have anything to add? Uh, sure, yes. <laughs> we do, we have lots of questions, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, the question was why does privacy matter, Yeah. right? Um, I think it's always mattered, but we've, it's kind of been in the back of our minds because we've always had control, and that's what privacy really is, right? When it, you boil it down, it's like, who has control of what information about me? And it's always been mostly us, right? Um, there's a presentation that we usually share where we go through the history of technology in schools and how it, this hasn't become an issue at school necessarily because like you saw in the video, it was a manila folder in a, in a cabinet that was locked. You know, you weren't sharing it with multiple people outside the school. We live in a different world. Right. Um, and so the, the conversation has changed. I don't think necessarily does privacy matter. I don't, I don't think that's a new thing. I just think the elements around it have changed. And so we're having different discussions about it where we didn't have two years ago. So. Thank you. And that actually leads into, we've been talking about teachers and we've been talking about the kids. Um, for privacy awareness to be effective, we know there needs to be two-way communication also with the parents. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was just wondering, how do you engage parents and what challenges have you experienced doing so? And Greg, do you want to start with that yeah. one? So we've been having this discussion a lot, me and uh, some of the people in de my department where we're trying to figure out who, who are the best people to actually have those conversations with parents. And so we've talked about developing materials that we can send out to parents. And I know PTAC has some stuff and uh, Future Privacy Forum. Like there's a, there's a lot of stuff out there, which is great. But I think the most important thing about that is who's the one delivering that message to the parents. And, you know, schools have always been local control, right? Especially like in Utah, that we're, we're all about that. Like we want local control. We want everything to be at our local LEA, and I think that's where it, it comes down to, is we need to have the resources, and that's kind of my job, is provide the resources for uh, administrators at the local level, but especially teachers. Um, like, teachers are the ones, for the most part, using these, or not just devices, but apps and websites in their classroom. I think it would be important for them to understand, like, hey, if a parent comes in and talks to you and says, hey, I hear you're using this app in your class, what are you using it for? Like, they need to have an answer for that. They need to, they need to be prepared with that. And that's kind of where we want to go with that is just making teachers aware, first of all, of the privacy impact that, you know, these apps and websites have so that they can answer these questions from the few parents that probably will come in and ask about that. But they also need to think about that in their, in their own classroom. Why am I using this app? Like, does it have an educational purpose? Is, is it doing what I want it to be doing? If, it, if a parent came in and talked to me right now about it, do I have a good answer, right? So yeah. I, I think being able to provide teachers with at least the background knowledge of, of privacy and what they can and can't do, and then being able to support the decision of why they're using something to parents, I think, is the, the best way to go about that. Thank you. And Carrie, did you? So very concretely, we um, before a, a student starts at our school, and usually it's at sixth grade and ninth grade, um, those are the when we tend to have new students come in, but all of our transfer families do this too. It's mandatory that um, a, one, at least one parent or guardian and a child attend um, a technology orientation over the summer before they start the school year. Um, it's absolutely mandatory that they do it. We offer them, like I just did three last week, two were from 6 to 7.30 p.m. So I'll stay super late so that it meets families' needs for work. One was at like 7 a.m. So the next day it was a really fun long days um, talking in front of people for hours. So, um, and we talk about how we, why we believe that it's important for us to put a device in every student's hands. We talk about um, so we share some examples of what our teachers and students are doing in class so that they see that it is actually something that they could not do without the technology. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then we share information about what we call our digital citizenship program, our curriculum, which is integrated at every level in all content areas across our whole school because our teachers are all trained um, on it. And yeah. we and get cons and get ongoing coaching on how to do it too. Mm -hmm. It isn't just like they had a training and then it was like go go. Mm -hmm. um, and then part of that programming is a whole segment on um, on privacy. And we describe it as knowing who has access to your information, knowing who doesn't, and feeling empowered to share the information you want to share with the people you want to share it with. So privacy isn't just about protect, protect, protect. It's also about the power that is in your hands when you decide that you want to share something that you've created and what that does for you and how rewarding that can be to get the feedback that comes from that. And we want our students to feel empowered to do that too. Um, and so we start the conversation there with that compulsory um, uh, training and the student and their parent are sitting next to each other while we're talking about this and we have some interactive activities that they do that are digital and on paper um, and then we offer so that's like I, I would say that's our only guaranteed touch point where we have the attention of every parent and we basically catch about 98% of parents when we do this um, and then we offer uh, at least one webinar and at least one evening like parent session on technology and healthy digital parenting and all of that mm -hmm. over the course of the year. Sometimes we touch on privacy, sometimes we don't. I would say our attendance for those is we usually get, the, the webinars tend to get live about 80 people attending, which I think is pretty damn good for a small mm -hmm. school. Um, and they're at lunch time, we do them from noon to one so that we can try to catch people at a time when they may be able to pull away. Um, but then they're available and we can see how many times they get replayed and the numbers are pretty good. Um, and then the evening sessions are um, connected with like our parent council so that we get more people that way. Um, and sometimes we'll bring in experts and sometimes we'll just put the programming together ourselves. So that's, that's how we reach parents as a yeah. school. Yeah. Um, I will say that as a private school where the parents are paying tuition, I think they tend to be more invested in mm -hmm like coming on campus more often. On the other hand, some of them have to drive a great distance to get to our campus because it is in a public school that's like based on where you live. So it's, I don't know. You know, and that actually was making me think of another question, which is, uh, do you consider, is privacy expensive, both in terms of the money mm -hmm. involved, um, the actual money in, in terms of doing these programs, but also in terms of time. Mm. It sounds like there's there's a lot of time invested, and mm -hmm. and I'm wondering whether that's an upfront investment. If it gets easier, what what have been your experiences with that? And Carrie, if you wanted to just continue. Like, oh, okay, sure. I'm yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think when we first started developing our program it was a great deal of time investment because there wasn't anything to start with. Right. Um, so anytime you're starting from scratch, it's now that we're like three years into our program, um, it, it is much easier. Yeah. Um, when we have these, um, you know, like re-up conversations, which are similar to the, the purpose that your videos serve, they're shorter conversations and the teachers are like, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. And then it's, and then it's fine and they're, they're back on board, so. Yeah. Um, it does, there's, there's still moments of frustration. Like even though I was, I went in and talked to academic council who were the leads on all the different teacher teams to remind them why they have to request apps at the same time they, re they request books. The entire English department did not request any apps. They only requested but paper books. And I'm like, that's great. Okay, totally. And then a week before school ended, they were like, oh, by the way, we want to use this website. And they're like, but it's not an app it's a website and I'm like but they have to sign in so and so I don't know if that was me not being clear or if it was them choosing what to hear and what not to hear right. but we're constantly working on how to communicate this mindset to people who may it may not come naturally to them and so it is an area for growth for them and we need to meet them where they are and figure out how to use the language that they're going to respond to to describe the information it's easy for us in this room to use all this terminology and then trying to figure out how to translate that for you know, your career English teacher who's been in the high school classroom for 25 years and is damn good at his job to communicate that he needs to learn this and this is important even though he's r damn good at his job, right. right? So that's a, it's, it's an interesting nuance that we're continuing to learn about. And Greg, in your department, you travel all around the state. So you, do, mm -hmm. you, you work with very remote schools, very small schools. And so this question of is it expensive both in terms of money and time, I think, is very relevant for your team, too. Well, like I mentioned previously, like our department's funded, which is great. Um, but the, the schools don't 
get any funding for their, this purpose. And like I said before, as well, the data manager job was just given to somebody that was already there at the school. And like you said, they're rural schools that are very small. And uh, it's funny, the data manager job, depending on who you're talking to, if it's a large school district, it's somebody in IT because they go, oh, data, give it to the IT guy, right? Or if it's a small school, they go, well, we don't have a data guy, so uh, secretary, let, let's give it to you because we're like the two busiest people on campus. Yeah. Right? Let's give them more. Give them more information. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it was kind of ridiculous hearing that because, and they, they tell us pretty honestly, we have a good relationship with them and they, they're pretty honest with us where they're like, this is one of many hats and it's probably on the priority list down at the bottom, if not the most bottom thing of the list. And so that's our job is just, okay, what can we do to help you since we are the ones being provided with the, like this is our full-time job. How can we help you research or do anything? Like what questions do you have? What problems do you have? How can we solve them? Uh, and there's oftentimes where we will go to an area and talk with several data managers or whoever it may be, and they are pretty upfront about the challenges that they're facing. And during that car ride home or when we're in our office, like that's the discussion that we're having is how can we change board rule? to make it more efficient for them to do this job where actually we can do it instead of them, you know? How can we get this so it's not ad hoc where they're putting in every one of these apps and websites and like how can we facilitate that at our level where it's just automated? And we're, these are the discussions that we're trying to have just because it does take an absurd amount of time to do a lot of the things that we're asking them to do at our state level. Um, and so we're, we're trying to bear that burden as much as possible because we are funded, but um, I, I still understand that the, the time invested at each individual LEA is more than we want it to be at this point, and we're trying to get that down. Thank you. And I have three more questions, and then we're going to ask you all questions. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, so, um, now that your programs have been in the wild a bit, what kind of feedback have you received and how has that feedback maybe changed your approach? And we'll start with you, Greg. Yeah, so um, at the end of the course that they have to take, I just say comments, like course comments. And for the most part, they're pretty receptive to it. Like I'm very happy with what's, what they've told us. Um, mainly because they were excited that it wasn't as boring a video as the state could make. Um, <laughs> so we're pretty happy about that. But the, the thing that we hear a lot is, this is good information, good to know. But the, the best thing about, I, I wouldn't say how successful the program is, but what I hear more often are conversations being had with teachers and, and schools that even before the school has done their training, like they've got on, they've seen this resource, and the teachers are then going to the administration saying, hey, I just took this course, like, am I okay to use this app? Or am I okay to do this? Have we approved this? Like, the thing that I am most proud about is that the conversation is happening now, where before they didn't even know it was a conversation. Um, and just getting that groundwork going is great, and now we just need to build it up to step two. What do we do from there? Thank you. Um, so when we started having these conversations with those teams of teachers, like I said, I think their initial reaction was like, oh my goodness, thank goodness you do this for us and we don't have to do this. We didn't even realize this was something that needed to be done, but it's now, now we realize how important it is. Now what's great is when a teacher asks to start using a new portal or app or something like that, they'll, I do get the email right away. Um, and rather than me just reading through everything and comparing to other resources and just saying yes, I will write back and I will not, I will ask how they're using it because sometimes the policy itself or the terms of use itself, it doesn't tell you the whole story. It really depends on what the use looks like in the classroom and that's led to really great conversations about yes. how they're using it and why they're using it. And sometimes it turns out I don't even really need to dig that deep into this tool because we already have a tool that's approved that does the same thing or does it better and the teacher just didn't know that the person across campus was using that other tool. So that's led to some really good conversations about pedagogy, which I think are 
Like that's what I care about. I mean, my job, and when it comes to the privacy and how that um, sort of interweaves with all of my other responsibilities, really what my responsibility is, is to remove obstacles mm -hmm. so that teachers and students can get to the good, creative, innovative work that they wanna do. My job is not to be like, you didn't think about privacy, shame on you. It's really not, right? Um, so I think the fact that I'm having these conversations about why they're excited and how great this tool is and how they're using it and how they, like other things they maybe haven't thought about, I mean, that's what I'm grateful for, as, as that's been a result of the process. And actually, that leads into the next question, which is, um, what were things you wish you'd known before you got started? You've talked about kind of things that, that help, you actually create pathways to help teachers know, um, find out about things that they might not be aware of, but what were some, some things that you learned along the way that um, you would offer as shortcuts for, for future? Um, one of the things that, I guess I kind of knew unconsciously because I was the teacher like you like we talked about and so I was I was using all kinds of things that I shouldn't have been using um, same <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. um, is and I knew this because as a teacher I was on the receiving end of this is that a lot of times and I, I get this this approach the companies are going after the teachers right. to get the investment in the tools because right. once they can get a teacher who's an evangelist for their tool that's how it spreads in a school culture and as the person who's the lead on tech that's how I want it to spread I don't want to be the one who says you should use this I want them to be like we want to use this because we're excited how do you balance that I think that's what I've learned the most is trying to walk that fine line between encouraging them to try new things while insisting that they let me know what those new things are and not making them feel like I need to know so that I can have oversight and I'm gonna watch everything you do. I just need to know so that I can like check on a couple of things and maybe be in the classroom the first time you use it so I can see what it looks like. Oh. Not because I'm watching you as a teacher, but because this is going to have an impact on a bunch of other systems in our school and so there's other things I need to think about behind the scenes that you haven't considered and that you don't need to. And how do you like, but when I come in their classroom, there's a certain feeling when the administrator's in the classroom. So how do you, ha anticipating that that will happen and figuring out how to make sure that, that people feel open to that. Thank you. I think that's really helpful, especially for the folks in this room who are dealing with similar questions and mm. issues. And how about you, Greg? Repeat the question one more time. Okay. Um, uh, what do you wish you'd known before you started? Uh, are there any pitfalls to avoid or shortcuts or must-dos? Great, okay, just wanted to get clear. <laughs> no, it's I always Carrie did an excellent job. Excellent student, that. always asks um, the question again. Clarification. <laughs> Can I have the, the origin of the word, please? <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll have to ask Jim for that. <laughs> uh, I think, I, I just attended a conference in, in Utah for the tech directors, which a lot of them are um, data managers as well. So we gave a little presentation, but I love being in the room with different people within the district, whether they're tech or curriculum or whatever, just understanding how all those pieces kind of fit together. I didn't realize at the time when I was that teacher how it affects the network or how it like uh, okay. the other costs involved I should say that so we're talking about privacy costs right now right but like physical costs those types of things um, as well just the whole infrastructure of the school like what is what is having Google Apps for education what is that going to entail because I was the first teacher that probably asked for that in my district because I went to a conference and I'm like oh Khan Academy, cool, I wanna use that. Oh, they have to have a Google Apps account. Okay, how do I do that? So I researched it, contacted my IT people. Hey, can we get this? No, we can't get this yet. Okay, well, why not? I don't understand, like, there's so many working part, like moving parts that are involved with technology in general, but learning and teaching, like, it's, I, I wish I knew how that all fit in as well as the privacy part. Like privacy wasn't even a discussion until the last two years. So there's just so many things that uh, adding technology or whatever you want to call it into the classroom does affect, including curriculum, including cost, including personnel, those types of things. So from a teacher or administrative view, like that's what I wish 
I would have understood a little better. Thank you. I think that there are indeed a lot of moving parts, and that's an important uh, point to be made. So what is the one thing you would like people to walk out of this room, or if they're watching at home or at the office, what is one thing you'd like them to, to take away from this video and this conversation? So innovation and privacy can exist in the same place. And you can have a policy around privacy in your district, but you may have to bend your own policy in order to meet the needs of a certain learner in a certain circumstance. And it's possible if you're having conversations with teachers and parents, and when you've bent your policy, it's because everyone is fully informed and has agreed to that, because that's what's, the, that's what's best for that child at that moment. So I think within policy, which can seem so strict and rigid, there is creativity that's a part of this job, and that's like, that's the part of this that I love the most. When I have a student who's like passionate about graphic design and none of the design apps or programs that we have already bought into as a district really meet his needs because he's so far above and beyond his classmates. But his art teacher is like, he wants to spend extra time with me every day after school for an hour working on this graphic design and I don't have the tool that he really needs. Mm -hmm. And I look and none of the tools that really fit all the good Kappa Furpa boxes meet his needs either. So we start talking to his mom and we start looking at things and I ask her to read through some information with him about these different tools and what they do and what they have access to and we settled on something and we put it only on his device and we had like written permission from the mom and it only took us about a week, it really wasn't that big of a deal. And this kid starts coming up to me in the hallway showing me these amazing animations that he's created and I was blown away. And we did that because we were willing to try and get creative. And so I think the biggest takeaway is create the policies, create the structures, but then think about the people and what they need and make sure that you're willing to move within those structures in a creative way. Thank you so much. And Greg, what's the takeaway, the one takeaway for you? I was thinking along the same lines, actually, where Excellent. a lot of the questions that we usually get are, so we can't use this website we can't use this app that we can't email anymore like <laughs> we didn't say that at all <laughs> like that's your interpretation uh, and the more we dig into the law and to policies and different things like that like at first people feel like they're restrictive like uh, it's not allowing me to do what I want to do right now right but if you really understand FERPA or COPPA or or state law or local policy like Carrie was saying, there's ways to, to move throughout that. Like it's, it's fluid, it's functional, right? You just have to be able to understand what those things are that you, that you would need to do in order to, to prove that app or that website for that student like you were mentioning. Like talk to the parent, get par parental permission. Like why isn't that a thing that you're just, you know, going to if, if you have that one student that needs this extra boost or whatever. So just being able to understand the law and policy is really eye-opening and actually isn't as restrictive. It's actually more open for discovery and being able to do new things. Thank you. Okay, and now we have an activity for you video viewers, uh, <laughs> uh, especially if you're in a group. Think about how you create a culture of privacy in your school or how you plan to do so. And if you have friends or colleagues around, take a minute to do this on your own and then discuss as a group. And we're done. Thank you so much.